Okay. Consulting partner, and this, and I asked him how many 
how many AI engagements are you doing? And he said 2,000 plus. So there's a lot of activity happening in this space. And, and we're fortunate to have a session planned out. And the session was planned out because you asked to. Because we sent out a survey and we asked people, what do you want to hear in, in this session? And the top one was AI and RPA. And that's why the session has been put together. So when we do send out surveys to you, please take the time to fill that out because that shapes and informs the event. So the event is by you, for you, and that's what you see in Associates does. Um, uh, the other thing I would mention is, um, is we, we also have um, a great lineup of speakers. We have industry leaders that are analysts that will give you the trends on what AI is doing and where it can, what is possible in the terms of use cases. We have a TV show producer uh, that probably have seen The Scorpion Show, so we've introduced the TV show producer as well. We also have leaders from gaming and insurance industry uh, as a panel members. And we also have a data scientist view on AI. So the, we went for a treat, and this, this program was sold out. We had a ton of people away. So uh, if you made it to the room, you're lucky. <laughs> Uh, but it's amazing, it, it just shows the, the feedback that you give us uh, leads to that, the audience, the, the traffic we get, and the, and the program that brings to life uh, an exciting program out here. Uh, I, I do know, at, at, as we're talking about AI, we talk about how many opportunities are there, but most companies, I understand, we see it in websites and better than that, to, to pick it up and do it in a way that's uh, logical. So today we'll get educated, right? I will get educated as well on how to do it and where the companies are. very few people, there are people in the planning and design, very few in the deployment phase, so it's not surprising at, at all where AI is, and, 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 and so on. Still, still somebody is uh, trying to change their opinion on where which phase they are. <laughs> <laughs> Before we, we get the speakers, we always like to thank our platform sponsors. Uh, and to, I want to bring up uh, Druva with a substitution. A quick that. Sub substitution. You, you're the sub? <laughs> That's right, and, uh, I'll, I'll introduce myself and make it easier for you. Thank you, and thank you. Not a problem. at some point within IT. I've been doing this for a little while. So um, what we do here at Druva is we're a cloud-first company. We actually back up all of your data into the cloud directly built on AWS. So as we were having a chat over here at uh, this point table in the back, what cloud strategy today has become is essentially how do I make sure that I have all of the backup that I need in the cloud, but it's completely secure. So most of the time it's a security conversation and typically we, we have those conversations very, very um, effectively with MCAs towards the end. With organizations like NASA and, uh, and the Air Force, we actually can protect um, multiple workloads from, from your laptops, mobile devices, to the data center, as well as actually protecting infrastructure and platform as a service. So, being able to manage snapshots in the cloud, all done seamlessly in, in, um, in the platform. That's, that's kind of what we do here at Druva. So if there's anything more than that, please come see me. I'm going to keep it short and sweet, but uh, happy to answer any of your questions uh, later on. Thank you.
But, but that disruption that's being caused with digitization, we really didn't change much of anything. So I, we have what I call the analog trinity for the last 250 years. So in the analog trinity, um, this was what, what led to a capitalist-based society or a capitalist-centered society. We use bureaucracy, process, and rules to create more capital wealth. Okay, And so variation that, that will actually lead to poorer results. And really all this technology is doing is leveraging human capabilities. That's all, all that technology ever does. And so because of the scale of these solutions, I can't afford to be stupid, so to speak, because you know, if, if I leverage stupid, I'm getting stupider. And I'm getting less good results, and that's a bad thing. So you're going to see this real, almost relentless optimization and categorization of people in traditional knowledge worker roles. And so you better be the best, just like in sports or in something like acting. Um, a lot of those people are going to be in companies that are entirely new and are completely focused on AI as a source of, of, of new, new revenue and new results. A ton of other companies are going to be in the middle that they're using this to kind of enable or enhance what they already do, um, but also try to get to disruptive results. Okay. So at the end of the day, I might be um, uh, a consumer product company. A uh, great example I have for this, anybody like Cheez-Its? It's one of my favorite examples of digital disruption. So as a kid, I loved Cheez-Its. And if you were like me, I used to dig through the whole box looking for the two or three of the crackers that were overdone. They were a little bit brown because they tasted so much better to me. And it was like uh, Cracker Jacks trying to find the prize inside of them. Now, there's a team of engineers at Sunshine Bakery that's, whose lifelong pursuit was to get rid of those crackers, yeah. right? Because they were defects according to how the company worked. And a few years ago, Sunshine Bakery actually was doing some digital disruption. They surveyed all their customers and said, if we were going to come up with new flavors, what flavor would you want? And overwhelmingly, the number one flavor that was asked for was, well, toasted cheeses. <laughs> so the company was relentlessly trying to get rid of the one thing that their customers actually wanted. And today, Toasty Cheez-Its is their number one selling brand in, in, the whole, in the whole green. So even in something like crackers, I can have digital disruption, and something like artificial intelligence can fundamentally change how the business operates. And so when I, and when I hear companies, well, we can't change that much or whatever, if I can change crackers, I can disrupt what you do as well. And then finally, there's a lot of organizations that will argue, look, if I'm manufacturing steel, steel is steel. But I can still dramatically optimize how I run that business, how I produce results, how I customize both the item itself and then how I deliver it so that it's just in time and it meets people's expectations. That's part of that context economy that we're moving to again. Um, the other key thing here is that AI is not a static thing. And I get this a lot with, with RPA as well. People say, well, how long does a, a robot in RPA last? And I said, well, how long does your business process go without ever changing, ever? Now, when I started my career in IT in the early 1990s, I worked for the thing called Lotus Notes. Anybody ever hear of that or remember? Yeah, I still have it. <laughs> exactly. So I had a client, uh, a high-tech client in Silicon Valley that came to EY and said, hey, we want to use this RPA stuff. We have a mainframe system that ma manages our parts numbers, and we workflow it with Lotus Notes. And I said, is this like a software museum? This is, this is like you know, software archaeology. But no kidding, with RPA, I can actually make that old technology um, useful for a little while longer. And, and we talk about technology debt, how far indebted is an organization, how much are you counting on technology that's 20, 30 years old? You can revive it for a while. So when the question comes up, you know, how long will the bot last, it depends on how much your process goes through change. My mainframe software is not going to change anytime soon, so I'm pretty good there. But when I'm looking at a website, how often do you have a website change? Almost daily. And so in that instance, I need to maintain the bot daily as it, as it goes on. This is even more true with artificial intelligence, because the idea of artificial intelligence is I keep getting smarter and smarter based upon new data, changing context. And if you needed one thing yesterday, you need something else tomorrow. So these things need constant care and feeding. And a lot of organizations aren't prepared for that additional cost. And this is, again, when we're looking at a new workforce, the curation of data to feed these beasts is going to be an absolute key. The other thing we talk about a great deal in AI is bias. There's input bias, there's output bias. And so if I go back to like a, a bank example. When I feed the machine and it's going to learn, if I, if I feed it bias, it's going to be even more biased. And we see a great, great deal of that. If I was going to um, come up with an AI that's going to monitor uh, mortgage applications, 
hypothetically, because we don't actually do that yet. Totally kidding there, we do. But if there are biases in how I select people for who gets a mortgage and who doesn't and what's their risk factor, that bias is gonna be multiplied maybe millions of times. And, we, we, and so the testing of my, my training process and, and the creation of upfront test data and the test cases and the ethics and morality that I embed in that become huge issues. When I talk to uh, executives about this stuff, I say, look, if, if you're having discussions around this and you're not getting really uncomfortable with it, then you're having the wrong discussions. And if you think that you, when someone asks you a question and you can answer it with, you know, definitively, I know the right thing to do, then you're asking the wrong questions. Because very purposely, we should be addressing stuff that we haven't done in the past that are going to be challenging to us in, in ways that we didn't expect, and that's how I get these disruptive results. So these things require a great deal of ongoing effort, and as I look at how the workforce is going to change, it's going to be in this supporting role, making sure that the AI remains effective, continues to operate the way we intend it to, and we're applying the learnings that come from it in effective ways. Now within UI, we do all kinds of work in this space. We're learning too. Um, as I said, we're up to over 1,500 bots. We have many AI solutions that we've built internally, and we're trying to learn it as well. And, and I tell clients, you know, we've done the bleeding for you. And, and that's not, uh, it's a very apropos metaphor because it, it can be very painful at times. But as an audit company, if, if I think of my analog company for my books with bureaucracy process and rules, I mean, who's the standard bearer for, for uh, capital management over the last 250 years? It's an audit firm. And so if we're looking at who's going to be disrupted by these technologies, we look at ourselves first. Some of the things that we look at as how do I make sure that I'm getting value from it? Got to be unbiased or as unbiased as possible. One of the keys to being unbiased is being aware of bias. So we work very hard on when we, when we come up with test data, we come up with test cases, and we look at the results, can we, can we identify the bias that's going to be there? And then how do we mitigate that as much as possible? Is it resilient? Um, this is another key. The more you depend, so in, in, my, in my second book I talk about the six new normals, and the first is quality. We have an expectation of perfection after 30 or 40 years of this incremental improvement snickering thing, we expect everything to work all the time, every time. And, it, and we don't notice that things are working perfectly all the time, we notice when something goes wrong. And in fact, the really innovative companies, there's a, there's a hotel chain that I work with where they actually manufacture errors on purpose. So if you've ever, if you travel a lot, you go up to the counter and you're ready to check in, like, oh, I'm so sorry we lost your reservation. And you lose it, right? You're on, you're on Twitter and you're like, I can't believe that these guys screwed this up again. Say, oh, we're so sorry. Uh, we got you an upgraded room and here you go. So literally manufacturing errors so that they can turn around and, and recover. And actually you're, you're happier after the fact than you were before. <laughs> if you just checked in and got to your room, you wouldn't have expected that. But by manufacturing errors with the right people at the right time, you actually generate better results. Um, so resilience is, is what happens when something goes wrong and how fast can you recover from it? And, and how do you turn that into a positive, actually, in a world where we expect perfection all the time? Explainable. This is one of the great challenges, and, and there's a, a huge debate between supervised and unsupervised learning. The supervised learning is I'm, I'm involved in it and I can see what the AI is coming up with, and I'm, I'm not necessarily interfering, but I'm interceding when I have to if I see things that I don't like. Unsupervised learning is just go figure stuff out and show me what you come up with. And people talk about you know, the apocalyptic uh, application of AI where by the time we realize that it becomes self-aware, it's too late because theoretically it's going to be smarter than we are. So there's a lot of ethical debate over that kind of stuff. And is it right or not? That's going to be one of the great challenges of our age, I think. Transparent. Again, can I see the process as it, as, it, as it happens? And can I make sense of it as I go? And then performance. I mean, we're, we're expecting greater performance from these things, but it takes us back to, can I operate my organization at the speed that those insights come? And in most cases, the answer is no. Um, we've been building a number of, of assets around this. Predictive analytics was a big piece of this. So can I figure out where I can make repairs uh, on a railroad line? And in Japan, where the trains go about 200 miles per hour, you put cameras on the, on the front of the train that actually look at the rails as you go down at 200 miles per hour and can figure out where to do the maintenance. In that application alone, you saved about a billion dollars a year in maintenance. So the savings can be enormous with the right kind of use cases, but the organization needs to be able to operate at that speed as well. Some, use, some case studies, 
to get a sense of the disruption, so we're doing an uh, AI strategy for Malta, a very small island, part of the EU. But Malta, Estonia, Singapore, countries that weren't necessarily considered leaders are actually coming up with new legislation, new funding models, and so forth, so that this is a chance for them disruptively to leap ahead of other, other um, countries. And so, uh, has anybody seen with Estonia uh, virtual residency or digital residency? Any one of you can become a resident of uh, Estonia, which allows you to open a, a business there and open a, a bank account there, but you, you never set foot there ever. And Dubai is actually looking to do the same thing. So all of a sudden, where I, where I run my business and what's taxable or not taxable, now it's up to you to make sure you pay those taxes in your native country, but Estonia is not going to tell on you. So, you know, Kazakhstan's in the same bucket. You're going to see a big disruption, and the people that are more open, or the countries that are more open to these sorts of things are going to potentially take big uh, leaps ahead. If I'm eliminating a bunch of, of knowledge worker jobs across the country, that's a big hit on national revenues against income tax. So even in the United States government, they're trying to figure out how are we going to make this up, and there's talk about taxing robots and taxing AIs, which is going to be an interesting model. Uh, so with the government of Malta, we're actually helping them put together that strategy so that they can do this leap ahead of other, other countries based upon how they legislate, regulate, and fund these sorts of things. For a bank, um, by using bots and a little bit of AI, we've automated processes have a 67% reduction in labor in that particular process. Better outcomes, more predictable outcomes, faster outcomes. Um, and over 90% of, of the transactions in that, in that process were fully automated, no human touch whatsoever. We can easily see a 20 or 30% reduction in cost in a traditional business process. More importantly, we see a 90 to 95% reduction in cycle time. And so in the analog world of capitalism in the last 250 years, dollars were how we measured success. In the digital era, seconds is how we're gonna measure success. It's a, it's a time is the unit of measure. And the, and the one thing that's true is I can, I can fake anything except fast. I can pretend that I care, I can pretend that I'm cheap, I can pretend that I have high quality, I can't pretend I'm fast, I either am or I'm not. So speed of execution is gonna be a determining factor as we move forward. And then finally, even a mining firm is achieving disruption. So they, we've gotten smart enough with a solution for them that it's, a person can be in the mine, which is an incredibly loud environment, filter out all the background noise and allow them to interact with um, uh, voice recognition to tell them what they need to work on and so forth. I was in Peru a couple years ago and they have a completely automated mine in Peru. No human workers go in or out of the mine. And what was interesting is that means I don't have to worry about the environment, I don't have to worry about oxygen levels, methane levels, the mines can be made shorter because I don't have to have them human height. It completely transforms how you do that work. And so that's, that's how you know you're getting this stuff right. You're changing almost everything about how you operate. Uh, back to the space stuff, 10 million times faster analyzing uh, data coming from satellites and from telescopes. So the other thing you see is this, is this is the opposite of snickering. I'm not talking about one or two or three percent improvement, I'm talking about leaps and bounds, orders of magnitude of change. And can your organization absorb that rate of change as it comes? Because it is coming. Uh, and that was about it for this. So you know, we talk a little bit about workforce, what do you do? And what can you do about this? It was, I was asked to uh, weigh in on um, putting together a curriculum for a master's program in data analytics. And they said, well, you know, should we have Python? Should we have Java? What languages should we analyze? They said, you need philosophy. You need, a, you need a humanities class or two in this. Because, again, if you're getting this right, you should be having, I mean, you should be up at night kind of staring at the ceiling saying, wow, should I even do this? Right? Is this the right thing to do? And what's the definition of right or wrong in this world as we do more of this AI stuff? Um, so the, the ethical implications, if you're, not, if you're not starting to have those questions, you're not going at this the right way, and you're not getting the results to expect. Which leads, I guess, to my closing point. People ask, is this the right thing to do or not? It's not optional, okay? When people ask me, do I do this automation? Do I do RPA? I said, RPA is optional today, like having a website in the 1990s was optional. Because there were companies in the mid-90s mid that said, well, why would I have a website? What's the value to me? They're long gone at this point. The same is true of this automation. The difference is you don't have 10 years to think it over. You have two or three. And so when I see people that are exploring this stuff, you better move from exploration to implementation really quickly, 
where by the time you've figured it out with a tire team at an offsite doing an ROI of an R RP RFA or whatever, <laughs> right? I joke about that all the time. We have to go. We have to go to Orlando so we can figure something out. No, not really. <laughs> by the time you do that, it's probably too late. And so with that, I think we have just a little bit of time if there's any questions. Any of you expecting us to have like a code review? That wasn't part of the plan. Yes? So what in the world will human resources be doing? Hello. What in the world will human resources be doing in these environments? What will be the role of actually managing, recruiting, training, and retaining? Entirely different. And in fact, most big companies, I think something like 73% of people under the age of 30 in the United States work for companies with less than 100 people. I have another client, Fortune 200, where I think it was like 80% of their new hires leave within a year. Because a, a person that's grown up digital and, and has you know, social media and all this stuff, I go in and you, and you say, okay, we want you to apprentice for the next two years, and then maybe you'll get a 5% raise. And then you have to go into a meeting where we talk about stuff, but we never decide anything. And they're like, I'm out of here, man. There's no way I'm doing that. Um, and I work with a few law firms that are actually doing reverse mentoring, where the senior partners that are two years from retirement are hooked up with a brand new associate so they can kind of figure out how the world works now. And so the role of human resources, it, it better become cyber resources pretty quickly. Because the best solutions is going to be this interesting combination of machines and artificial intelligence and humans that help guide them. And what we measure and what we value and what we promote are going to have to change to reflect that reality. So we actually have a whole organization of, in consulting in EY that focuses just on the transformation of HR to reflect that change. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, so we see a lot of companies, uh, like electric vehicle companies, for example, that are bringing um, autonomous, right, autonomous vehicles, AI, and automation, but they're starting from scratch without the uh, architecture, customer base, et cetera, and they're starting their business using AI, and machine learning, et cetera. Um, so compared to companies that have been around for 50 or so years, what do you think are the gaps or differences and perhaps even challenges of these new age companies, given that they're not dealing with, um, they haven't evaluated their customer base or analytics today. So I'm curious of your perspective on that. Right back to the HR question. Where, so, and I don't know when it happened, but all of a sudden I'm no longer the young person in the room, like during a meeting. Like, when did that happen? But when younger people come into an existing organization, they're like, this is stupid. Why are we having a meeting? Why don't we just make a decision? They don't value necessarily the experience that, that made those good decisions 10 or 20 years ago. So as much as we don't value the need for speed and so forth, if we've been around for a while, there is some value in those discussions. And some of those biases that are built into our organizations that lead to conservative, maybe conservative or risk management sorts of things um, aren't valued enough until something goes horribly wrong. So autonomous vehicles is a great example. So the, the first fatality of, the, of the, the car that ran over the woman in Arizona, you say, well, how does that happen? And, and I think it's something like 90% of, of accidents that are involving uh, self-driving cars right now are caused by a human not following the rules. So in that fatality, the woman was crossing, not in a crosswalk, at night, right? wasn't following the rules. So the problem with AI is we, we guide it and tell it what to do. And, and in our humanness, we tend to not follow the rules that we set for them. And that's what's going to cause a lot of those errors. So if I'm not, if I'm not taking into account all the learnings that a 50-year-old company might have, I'm going to miss a lot of that stuff. And the problem with this AI stuff is that the way I find out that I get, did something wrong is usually a really bad outcome because I'm expecting perfection, back to the earlier point. What I find interesting, too, is the car companies no longer think of themselves as car companies. They're trying to think of themselves as transportation companies. Or, or destination companies. And so even like a Ford or General Motors having a really hard time reconceiving what their value proposition to the world is. It's not building cars, it's getting people to where they want to go. Yes? Um, very interested in the educational part. Uh, so it's good that you're being asked. Uh, we talked to a lot of students, a lot of universities, and there's a lot of confusion as to where they go. So as you look at the future, do you see AI and all of its pieces as being a major? or as being a minor included in the other uh, domains? So for a period of time, it'll be a major, and then I think it has to be a minor in other domains. Um, similar to that, so I have an almost 10-year-old daughter, and last night we were working on her coding project. 
And in fourth grade, she's in her fifth year of software development. She's been doing it since she was in kindergarten. And so my, my daughter last year, I remember she's doing um, uh, nested conditional logic trees in third grade. And so it's something that would have been you know, master level type software development 10 years ago, this kindergarten or, or third grade type stuff. But the way we know we've made the switch and we've done it effectively is it's no longer considered something separate. It's integrated into how we do everything else. Yes, sir. I don't know if you can spend a few minutes telling us how do you incorporate human insight and judgment into whatever you undertake to do. Maybe I'll make it a little more explicit. Oh, I'm sorry. Shall I? Did everybody hear me? No. I asked how do you incorporate human insight and judgment? So now I'll tell you a little story. Because I wrote the how in a very tangible way. What kind of conversation do you have to make this really happen? It is a fluke, because I'm sitting next to someone. I'm an Israeli, you can tell from my accent. He comes from Israel. I said, where from? He said, Kfar Aza. It's a remote location down south. You wouldn't want to be there. That's where they have the missiles flying all the time. And I was there a few months ago. Anyway, I tell him a story. Then you mention Waze. Waze is a creation in the state of Israel, 9 million people. They know artificial intelligence. So of course, when I come to Israel, I use Waze. And we go there twice a year for two months, and I'm not making up the story. About six years ago, I get into a car, it's a Friday night, and I put Waze. And my wife says, oh, great, we will not get lost. We get up on Highway 6, and at the end, I see something a little precarious. Uh, I move right, and it takes me into villages, which uh, even I felt a little uneasy, but you know, Waze. And my wife says, where are you going? It's Friday night. You know what Friday night is? I'm not going into the detail. Israel is fraught with danger as you drive. It was created in Israel. And within 10 minutes, I find myself Friday night when people leave the mosques and my heart sinks to my stomach. I didn't say it as a joke when I said my wife's judgment is sometimes better than waste. <laughs> she said you shouldn't. Go there. I said, Safa, but Waze says it's okay. <laughs> and I did. And I came just minutes before they started pouring out from all sorts of most, I won't go into the details. If you live there, you know what I'm talking about, but not elaborate. And I moved slowly. Luckily, it was a rented car. So I, we, when I came out, I was wet. I was sweating. She was right. Waze was wrong. How do you incorporate things like this? You know, my wife is always right. This time, <laughs> <laughs> how do you incorporate things like this? How would Waze know that this was dangerous to know? And my wife knew it. By the way, if you meet a teller, I'm seeing her praise all the time. I, uh, <laughs> so I learned this early in my career in the space industry. Our humanity lies in the exceptions. Not if, it's not in what we know or what we believe. It's what we. It's the surprises and the unknowns. And judgment is a result of of experiencing lots of those exceptions and that sense that something's wrong even though I, I think it's right. And so when Challenger blows up, I say to people all the time, if, if you had a, an expected failure and that's how you fail, you're incompetent. It's the unexpected failure that we learn from. And that our challenge is that as we do more of this automation, and our, again, our humanity lies in the exception, can we make the exception so that someone doesn't die? that the spacecraft doesn't blow up, that you don't end up in a, in a dangerous neighborhood at the wrong time. And knowing that that rounding error will always be there, can I anticipate it and can I learn from it when it happens? So take this as an example. How would you change ways right now in the light of my story? So, so there's, um, there's an optical, multi-spectral optical sensor. It just looks at your face at, at, and can see like your body temperature and so forth. And we can actually judge emotion from that. It's actually being used as lie detection because if you're lying, like the, the surface temperature of your skin changes. And so I can measure how nervous a person is in real time. And so in that instance, when I'm telling you, take a turn here to the right, and you're like, I don't know about that. I could actually sense your increasing discomfort and make that part of the data that I collect. So one of the challenges is there's more, when, when your wife is trying to assess that situation, she has more data than just your GPS location. So I need to get that other information incorporated. Stop me, that's the last question. My question is more, you heard my story. How would you go back? Explain the mechanism to all of us whereby 
you will not give me the answer, but you say, guys, there was something I just heard. How can we change ways, the program, how can we actually make a change which will incorporate this judgment by Moishe's wife? So how would you do it? The way, the way I do it technically is you come how... You come to UCLA to discuss here. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm asking about the mechanism. Yeah. You want to sit down yourself and do it. There will be a need for human input, looking someone in the eye. How do we go about it to make it better and not worse? Collect more data. So co collect, the, collect what's your level of comfort, what's your emotional state as I'm, as I, I'm moving through that. Um, one of the things you can do in ways if you've done it, like when you stop by a police speed trap, you can mark it. Well, then people's behavior change when I come to that particular location. I'm going to slow down a little bit. So part of what we're trying to do is to get into more data sets and, and data that wasn't part of the original equation so that I come up with better insights and that, that margin for error keeps shrinking and shrinking. The problem is the more I do that, the, the greater the likelihood of catastrophic results when I necessarily am wrong. But I, I don't know if that answers. One of the things that I would want to do when we're looking at this is how do I get more pieces of information so I have a broader I, I stop. view? It's a disconnect. You always give me the answer, we'll collect more data. I want you to tell me how you collect more judgments like that. The, the judgment is based off of those different pieces of data. Again. Well, I, in, 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 that, so in that instance, your wife is using a life of experience. Exactly. Right, and, and driving through the neighborhood, and there's different inputs that she's using to say, I don't care, Waze is not seeing what I'm seeing. No, she looked, used something from a newspaper recently. Hmm. Not life experiences, and her judgment was correct. And there are many judgments like this going on all the time, and that's what companies lose their share with their own judgment. Yeah. Okay. Well, obviously, and this ties to the question, how do I change my education, and how do I teach people differently so that they're prepared for this? Because that rounding error is not going away, and it's going to become more critical as we think we're better and better at our results. Yes. Right. So, uh, isn't yeah. what he's yeah. talking yeah. about yeah. curation? Yeah. Yes. It's the curation of the data yes. that exposes that. Yeah. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Sorry, we out of time and uh, Thanks, this is a great discussion. <laughs>
command and control and our electrical grid for California. Um, this is some of the technical and AI part. Um, short version is forward tracking through all possibilities and all, all thoughts, backtracking through everything a, a, a human may undo, um, handling deterministic and non-deterministic next steps. So if I'm here, I can only do this, or if I'm here, I can do any of these five things in any order. It'll handle all of the above. Um, I'll skip some of these, the hacking stuff, I won't get too much time for. We're on uh, virtual reality, we've been using this to help visualize cyber. For people with you know, computer degrees, we've been coding since kindergarten, and like that guy's daughter, you know, when we have this conversation, they can picture the structure like a building in their head. For everyone who isn't, they're sitting there going, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. So by coming up, <clears throat> coming up with analogies we're familiar with, if my systems were planets, and my security vulnerabilities were craters, and my bandwidth was connections like network pipes between the planet, and the usage was water levels in the pipes, <coughs> you get the idea, then I can start floating around the universe to look at cyber and see my systems, and see that the red one is on, under attack, and the green line is fine, and the, the red pipeline is, is a bottleneck on the network. So you can fly around this like you would in Google Earth, and go visit your bugs, and see your systems, and see what's down. And you can actually drill into it and see which IP address, where is it coming from, and shut it off right there. Um, we also designed a NORAD level nuclear uh, <coughs> secure system for storing data, so hacks like the OPM hack wouldn't happen again. Uh, where we lose uh, Navy SEALs home addresses and the names of their wives. Um, so if anyone's interested in an effectively unhackable vault, um, uh, happy to go through that in detail. Unfortunately, I, I we don't have enough time today. I'll run through a couple of AI stats here really quick. Um, the third business I mentioned is Concierge Up uh, at ScorpionComputerServices.com. Effectively, you bring us any problem and I mean any problem, with 10 grand or more in funding, and we solve it using the geniuses we have, the Rolodex we have, and the 30 years of experience we have in good processes. So from the marijuana industry trying to grow up and be like Coca-Cola, to kids who have anorexia trying to find uh, foods that are odorless and tasteless but high in calories and fat, to people who have a book and want to make it a New York Times bestseller and get it endorsed by a celebrity, to people who have to get stuff off Google that's embarrassing their family name. At this point, we just gave up on saying we solve any technical problem and just said we'll just solve any problem, period. So we're fixers. We do offshore algorithmic cryptocurrency arbitrage for the last uh, year and a half, about 8% per day, or double our money every eight days. Uh, that was fun. And then um, for the future, um, a little worried about the future here in the U.S. If you do the math, our cars are parked 97% of the time. If every student can Uber around all year in an automated Uber car with dedicated Netflix in the back and targeted advertising supporting the uh, Uber cost and you can get around for two bucks everywhere or free, nobody will need to spend 20 grand on a car anymore if you can get around all year for two grand. If you do that, then we don't need 160,000 Uber drivers or 1.6 million truck drivers or three million fo uh, folks who work as checkout counter people because when Amazon bought Whole Foods, they eliminated, eliminated the checkout. You never park an Uber ever, so you don't need the parking lots. That crashes commercial real estate because half of it's zoned for parking. In that commercial real estate, they'll build cheap prefab housing for the folks who lost their job from the factories. For 100 grand, they can have an apartment. That'll crash residential real estate because now you just took two precious commodities and made them twice as available with people who can no longer afford to buy them. You don't need dealerships because the cars are electric. You don't need gas stations, valets, car washes, tire centers, brake centers, pet boys, O'Reilly's, etc. There's a whole ripple effect, and that's just the cars. In the military, we employ 3 million people, 6 million indirectly. Um, we've been doing unmanned vehicles, unmanned drones, unmanned uh, boats for the last 15 years. We're never going to be putting 20,000 boots on the ground in France again. So how long can we do that job support program? I don't know. It went since we're 20 trillion in debt. You have money, your government has debt. One of you is interested in doing deflation rapidly, um, and it'll be a race to the bottom. 
If you think all this is happening 50 years from now, consider evolution is exponential, not linear. So it took us 8,000 years to go from the agricultural revolution to the industrial, 120 to the light bulb, 90 to the moon, 22 to the web, nine years to sequencing our own DNA. So these things will happen in the next five to eight years. And if we have 47% unemployment, you're looking at um, <clears throat> martial law, LA riot type activity, and one in two people can't feed their kids. This thin veneer we call civilization goes away in a weekend. Mm -hmm. Some of that's already happening overseas. There's less regulation. Chinese factory places 90% of human workers with robots. Production rises 250%. Defects drop by 80, and that was February 2017. Now, because I don't have time to update my slide, but uh, the point here is a minimum wage worker is about 33 grand a year, fully loaded. They only work one shift. So if you have a robot that works three shifts, no vacations, no weekends, no health benefits, no suing anyone, no going on strike, no raises necessary, then 100 grand for this arm that, is, uh, that has Moore's Law applied to it and is dropping in value is that reaching about that tipping point where it's cheaper than the human. Oxford listed all of these, you can scan them real quick, but these are all jobs that won't exist. In the Industrial Revolution, we put horses out of business, we used to have millions of them. In the AI Revolution, we are the horses. So, for anyone who believes intelligence affects their life, reach out and rent some. Thank you. No, Scorpio was my hacker name when I did the NASA hack, and uh, uh, there's no such thing as bad press, so we kept it to the name of the company. It's also a creature that's very docile until pushed too far and fiercely loyal to its cyclone, which is a family of scorpions. My company is now a home for the mentally enabled or an orphanage for smart people because they have nowhere else to go under my protection, so it seemed like an appropriate name. How do you get people together to come up with the idea of objects of interest? Uh, we don't. We are told them through years of experience in the military. Mm -hmm. So they tell us what they're looking for, we figure out how to see it. How do you figure out? We? Who is we? Uh, well, inside the company we have folks with uh, <coughs> masters and PhDs how, in computer vision for artificial intelligence. Uh, we have a, a, a whole bunch of brainstorming techniques and we, we usually get a bunch of sample images and sample videos from the best case scenario to the worst case scenario and then try to, to eliminate anomalies and um, false alerts and false alarms until uh, we get it down to something that's at least 80, 20 accurate. First, Walter, thanks so much for coming out today. Fascinating, fascinating uh, you know, story and information. And thanks to Piper for bringing you to us. Um, I have a very simple question. In, in the application of SendGen as a, a tool for automated testing, is there a self-healing component to that as well? You may have said so, and I, I just... Um, Self-healing is a little dangerous when um, you're looking at testing, partially because of the human judgment that he mentioned. Um, if you're trying to avoid bringing up, you know, if you're Bank of America and you have software updates going out every two weeks, nobody cares about the new features and the new bells and whistles. What they care about is you don't bring the bank down to its knees on Monday morning. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what will get you fired as a CTO. So what we do is allow you to guarantee that every new release is no worse than production. Now that means they both might have bugs, it might mean the new stuff doesn't work, but it's no worse. And that's a good baseline. So it's less about self-healing and more about pure regression, which is how can I prove I didn't break something by accident? Um, and for everyone who has software and they've launched it and they have customers who love them and everything else, your biggest danger at this point is not your new bells and whistles, it's how do I know that I didn't break something with the 3% human error? 
Thank you for your talk this morning. So I was wondering for your St. Jean project, where did you get the uh, training data? Because most of the good training data from academia, you cannot use for commercial usage. I'm just wondering how to get that. Um, so the system, uh, the nice thing about it is, well, first of all, we're in the real world, so we didn't have to use academic training data. We actually just worked on the customer projects we were working on. And many of these customers, which have had big systems, have been doing manual testing or some version of record and playback, macro, painful, tedious testing for years. So we started with a lot of their data. Um, the second thing is SendGen itself is pure, meaning there is nothing in it and nothing hard-coded in it. Think of it like two chess computers playing each other that would exhaustively play every possible game of chess that I abstracted from that the concept of chess, the pieces, and the moves into a unique modeling language. So now, SendGen, there's nothing in it until you build a model of what you're trying to test. And the, the magic of it is understanding how to explain that model. The advantage of it is, if I was to write out every game of chess, I'd fill this building with paperwork. But the rules of chess come on a two-page pamphlet. You only have to write the rules and maintain the rules. We actually throw away all the tests every time because they're generated in minutes. So um, clearly I'm not going to have my kids be software quality assurance uh, people. <laughs> Can you kind of extrapolate out as to maybe some other fields that you think AI and technology are discussed will make be obsolete? Well, driving is actually a very difficult thing to do and automate. And they've done it. And when I say they've done it, humans have 4,200 crashes per day now. And we're still holding back and complaining because AI has crashed like twice. It doesn't matter if it's perfect. It matters if it's better than human. If you're looking at the greater good algorithm of human life. So if it can do that, it can do any job simpler than that. So if you think of any job that's repetitive, even within a context framework like driving, where things can go wrong, things can be broken, people can run out in front of you. Anything from that backwards, we know can be automated now. Now, AI evolves exponentially. We don't. So just draw those two lines, eventually singularity occurs and it's smarter than we are. And the last thing we will do is write something smarter than us. <laughs> and the first thing it will do is eliminate us. Because <laughs> if you look at nature, if you introduce a superior species to your ecosystem, the first thing it does is wipe out whoever introduced it, because that's the primary threat. And you can talk about ethics and boards and meetings all you like, but in the history, in the, in the history of humankind, we've never done the right thing as a majority, or we wouldn't still be talking about global warming. We do the fast thing, the greedy thing, the shortcut thing, or the thing that we could do in this country, but not that current country. So the code will leak out, it will get on the internet, it will learn everything. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be kept as pets and entertainment. Now, in the short term, uh, for your kids' sake, doing things that are uniquely human, creative, non-repeatable, like they went got into being a nurse, being a doctor, a psychologist, doing uh, marketing techniques, things that are very, very organic and not, there's no real method to the madness. It's kind of that human judgment and guidance. That's all that's left. If it's in any way systematized, it will be systematized. So don't tell them to become truck drivers. <laughs> yep. Just one question. Is there a prerequisite on the amount of data, like uh, your concierge up? Um, is there a, like a minimum amount of data you all require to come up with kind of your insights? Um, it depends on the area. If it's SendGen, uh, none. We can literally, as long as you have something to test, even if it's physical. We tested the doors in the train systems after 9-11 they have to be locked up the same as the uh, planes do, so you can't get to the pilot and hijack the, the train. They had done four tests on the door. Does it open? Does it close? Does it lock? Uh, we came up with 126 they hadn't died on a physical door. Well, it was a door with a car reader. Um, so it's one of those things that, uh, now, if we're doing learning, like on the uh, credit card side and the horse side, honestly, we'll take what we can get. Because again, my view is I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm trying to be better than human. So that's all I have to prove. As soon as I'm better than human, there's an ROI in it. So I set the bar low. <laughs> Sorry, I have no EQ. You need one of your super nannies. Super nannies right off work today. Yeah. <laughs>
I get a super nanny in here right away. Right away. Did you let me pick up on that thread? So we've been asking a little bit what your kids do, etc. What are you finding is that uh, is being done right with the people you hire that makes them extraordinary thinkers, think outside the box people? You you mentioned masters and doctorate degrees as I'm part of this institution. We get those out. Uh, but what type of superpowers are in the people that you bring into the fold to be the extraordinary thinkers in your environment? As hard as it is to find extraordinary people, we have not compromised. We are the only company out there with minimum human performance levels for hiring. Go to McKenzie, Booz Allen, anyone else, there is no minimum IQ for their or even test when they're hiring. And that's not an elitism thing. <coughs> that's a case of at that level, their human error rate is 0 0.02, not 3%. They're generally they're burning more glucose in their brain, working longer, faster, quicker their OCD levels are higher. So the things that screw them up for society make them perfect for eliminating risk. They make less mistakes. Now, we also have to study how do we find them and why do smart people quit their jobs? Because I wanted to keep them. And I had a slide on this, I took it out because of time, but part of it is uh, they quit because their boss is an idiot. So we, have, we stack the deck and they report to people with higher IQ. Doesn't mean they like their boss, but he's not an idiot. <laughs> Secondly, um, for them, fairness is more important than money. Fairness and, and, and acknowledgement. So we actually have our own judge duty court system with appeals process that's based on fact and reality rather than emotion and has fairness algorithms. So if you worked on a project for me with two other people and they didn't pull their weight and you came to me afterwards and said, I did half the work, uh, we have everything tracked, we're like, let's look at your contributions, edits, hours, and lines of code, and number of bugs, and we say, yep, you're right, you did half the work. So I have now been minus 16% unfair to you, and plus 8% extra fair to the others, because I paid you 33 and a third. Those will be your increments and decrements for the same thousand hours on the next project. So I will load balance your fairness to zero over the year. Because otherwise you'll build up resentment over the next two years and just walk into my office one day and say you quit. So there's a whole bunch of techniques like that. At school, I got A's and F's in subjects. I either loved the teacher or the subject, or I hated it. So I could turn on and off my intelligence depending on what I cared about. So we look at 10,000 school reports a year, and we hire the kids who have A's and F's. If it's all A's, they had a the tiger mom. If it's all F's, not our company. Um, <laughs> but if it's only those two extremes, there's something going on. And if we can catch them before they get sent to juvie, or as the others do, kill themselves by 16, uh, then we, we have a chance to turn it around and make them productive. And they also, there's one super nanny per 12 geniuses, and they slowly learn the value of EQ. They're never gonna be used car salesmen, mm -hmm. but they'll have better relationships with their wife, their kids, people they speak to, everything else, by adding a little EQ to it. Thank
blender is alive and well in the world, and two, you're about two minutes away from the bathroom boat. So I'm um, <laughs> going to just quickly acknowledge and celebrate and hopefully help you connect so you can optimize the break. Um, so I'd, I'd like to take this time to acknowledge people who are here, and if there's a provider member you've always wanted to talk to, now you can put a face or a color of clothes or something to a name and maybe uh, start a conversation at the break. If you wanted to ask somebody about what they're doing in their particular company, now's your chance to kind of pick a person and go, yeah, I want to talk to that person. So I'm just going to run down the list of who said they were coming today, and if you could, you know, pop off, that would be awesome. Okay, so AEG Worldwide. All right. Uh, Aerospace Corporation. Over there. Alvarez and Marcel. Yes. American Homes for Rent. Didn't make it. Uh, App Dynamics. Avery Dennison, and Belkin International, and City of Los Angeles, okay. uh, City of Santa Monica. Okay, special shout out to member. Um, Commercial Programming Systems, Inc. All right. Um, County of Los Angeles, Creative Artists Agency. Epson America, Ernst and Young, in the house. All right. uh, Farmers Insurance, and Fortinet. Fox, that's me. Hi. Oh, Herbalife. Okay, iSpace, and JBL. Yep. Cool. Kaiser Permanente. LA Care Health Plan, Laser Beach, and did I pronounce that right? Awesome. Lionsgate, hello. And Vagenic Technologies, Mobile for me. And Motion Picture Industry Pension and Health Plans. Here. Hi. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for the help. <laughs> Uh, Paraveda Solutions. Okay, and Pivotal. Remember, welcome. Thanks for joining. Uh, Solemn Consulting. Oh, and Sony Pictures Entertainment. Great. And Southern California Edison. G5 Data Centers. Okay, and wait for it. UCLA. Right. Thank you for everything you do for us. Uh, United Talent Agency. Hello. And the Walt Disney Company. And Wash Laundry. Wave Maker Partners. Transfer somewhere. And William O'Neill Company. All right, that's it. Enjoy the break. Thanks for coming. Everybody. Thanks for coming. 20, 20 minutes break. The people can be back at 11.10.
to change mm -hmm. how they need to operate.
sponsors besides Drua, and he's going to give a quick introduction about his company, uh, and then we'll get started with the uh, speakers after that. Thank you. But it's true. So what I'm going to talk about quickly is just going through some, first of all, I'm going to talk through some glossary, our glossary here. So there are two main things that people talk about when they talk about data science, right? The first thing is I'm going to use these really neat statistical methods, PCA or NLP or other TLAs that I can just pick up and I'm going to throw them at a problem and I'm going to see if I can suss some meaning or suss some information out of the data. I, I, in my mind, I typically think of this as analytics. Right? Like I'm gathering information about how my business is running and I'm putting it into a, a format where executives and other individuals can make actionable decisions. Right? Another way to think about data science is we want to take that first thing, the, first, the, the, the analytics, the techniques of, of gathering signals from the network and we want to make actions from it and we want those actions to be automatic. Right? So that's where we get to intelligent automation. Like how can we take the things that we found out about our network and make them happen extremely quickly or you know, on point, right? Without a human intervening, right? So if we're suffering from eight billion bot attacks, how do we know that? Because we have metrics that say that people have you know, thrown malformed URLs at us, that people have done massive attacks in Vietnam, Singapore, Russia, whatever, like that we're getting 45 million attacks you know, per, per on sale, something like that. We know that because we have surfaced it with the first and then we have blocked them with the second, right? So when we're talking about other terms that we can throw around in the space, and there's a lot of people who throw around a lot of words, and they use the, the bigger the words, the better, because that means you're smart, right? The bigger the word, like statistics, that's not big enough, but that's basically what the first thing is. Machine learning and artificial intelligence, to me, that's really the second thing, right? I'm, I'm taking this information and I'm making actionable intelligence about it. Somebody else asked me, what, what about actuarial science? And that's the first one, right? But it's basically all the same stuff. She's going to tell me I'm wrong. That's cool. Uh, big data is basically when I've got statistics and it's more stuff than I can fit on my laptop. And so as you guys can guess, since laptops keep getting bigger, the definition of big data keeps moving, right? What I can do on my laptop today is ludicrous to what we could do 10 years ago. So having said that, there are two cases that I want to talk about today. I am personally right now the tech leader for fraud, right? So I'm not allowed to tell you how much fraud we have, but we have some fraud. Uh, fraud, the way that we define it, and this is, we're going we're gonna to come back to this subject repeatedly. When you're doing these types of tasks, it's extremely important that you have a very good definition of what is the problem you're trying to solve. And in this case, what we're trying to solve is somebody using credentials that are not their own to obtain financial instruments from the company, right? So they're using stolen credit cards, using stolen accounts. They're somehow falsifying information about themselves in order to obtain financial gain. Right? And that's a very critical and important, like, very specific definition to use. Because right? then we're not, there are other ways to game our system. There are bot attacks to try to steal tickets, to try to buy tickets, but you're using a legitimate credit card. Right? 
That's a different use case. That's a different team. That's, that's a group, different group of people who solve that problem of trying to make sure that the on sales don't get sold out to one guy who just bought 10,000 tickets and everybody else is wondering what the hell just happened, right? Different group of people. So we are actually very active in the Merchant Risk Council. I don't know, is anybody else here at Merchant Risk Council you guys know? Maybe you do? <coughs> Nobody has any idea. Okay, great. Uh, Merchant Risk Council is basically a group of people who are trying to get together to solve the, the fraud problem. Because what's been happening is like after all these hacks, you know, the Experian hack, all these hacks that have happened, basically all of your credentials, they exist on the internet. All of your passwords, they already exist. So change your passwords, please. Different passwords per site, that just makes my life a hell of a lot easier. Makes your life a hell of a lot easier, please do that. So then the question is, how can data science help? So the next, and I'm gonna get to that, don't worry, I'm not leaving that dangling. The next problem that's actually very near and dear to my heart is what I was doing before I was doing fraud. There's a couple things I did in between, but. How many people here get the weekly Ticketmaster emails? You're welcome. That's me and my team, right? <laughs> so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we're going to get those emails into your inbox, have them be relevant, have them be timely, and have them be for shows that are not already sold out. Because nobody likes seeing, oh my god, Paul Simon, I love that dude sold out. Like, that's not cool. But you also need to be able to do all of that when you visit the website and it has to be delivered in sub 100 millisecond time. You know, knowing all of our inventory across all of our systems and have that be available and delivered, personalized to you when you go to the website. How do you do that? That's a, that's a data science problem. So let's talk about what data science is in practice in the frame of those two questions. Right, so first of all, we're trying to, we're trying to optimize an objective function. Right, I just talked about two objective functions, right? And I have to define them very, 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 very clearly, right? Somebody using fraudulent credentials or using false credentials to take financial gain from the company and being able to deliver personalized recommendations to an individual within a sub 100 millisecond time, right? Those are two important, that, that you have to know what that is. When you're gonna do this, you have to plan some exploratory work, right? Like, like personalized recommendations. Who here has, has anybody here tried to write a recommender? Yeah, one person, right? And you start and it's like, oh my God, like all I have to do is just like, okay, well if they like the Clippers, then they probably like basketball, maybe they like the Lakers. You're gonna end up with a lot of pissed off people if you do that, right? <laughs> it won't work. And they say like, well if they like the Clippers, maybe they like mariachi music. Well, it turns out the answer is yes. Right? So that, that, one, that, one always, that one flummoxed a lot of people, but then you look at it and it's like, oh, hey, the data supports that. So how do you bubble that up? You can't do, use rules doing that. And you need some kind of POC, some exploration of the data. You're going to need to implement a feedback loop. This is critical, right? So as you learn things about the data, you take actions on the data, the data will change. And so then, therefore, you need to be able to take the same set of actions that you did before and see how that data has changed and then update your systems, and you want that to be as automatic as possible. But you also have to account for different things that are going to happen in the system. Drift, right? A new action, like a new band comes out. Does anybody know who BTS is? Yes. Yeah, like three people? <laughs> BTS broke our systems the first time they came on board because everybody in the on-sale team is 40 and up, and we're like, Ooh, BTS? <laughs> and it, like, really, it, it was like we, have our, we ran our systems by DEF CON. They were at DEF CON 3. They were like, eh, whatever. And they, no, they were DEF CON 1. They were all hands on deck, like, oh shit, we're a loop, the house is on fire. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to tell you that, but whatever I do. And so now we know, right? And so we have to implement drift in the system. We have to see K-pop as an emerging thing and we have to track it, right? And we, the other thing that's very important here when you're putting together your data science systems, don't expect perfection. You, do, you shouldn't. You should expect results, but you shouldn't expect perfection. And I think the best analogy to think about this way is, like, you know, you're, you're in the mall and you see the guy and you're like, hey, the guy, and you wave and he waves back and it turns out he's waving at the guy behind you, right? You just screwed that up, right? It's very embarrassing. But your brain has a 97% chance of detecting people properly, right? So you shouldn't expect a system when it's trying to solve these very hard, very fuzzy problems to be that much better than you. And anytime somebody has something that's that much better than you, you should be like, oh, I need to like really investigate this before I trust it, right? Because it, it does happen. Like you do t sometimes get systems that are better than people at a lot of things. Chess, right? Like chess is a solved problem in this case. But it's rare and it's so rare that you should, you should be like, hey, wait a second, I wanna, I wanna know what's going on. What data science is not? 
And I say this to a room full of business people because I think this is very, 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 very important because I have been working with a lot of business people who don't understand some of these things. It is not deterministic. When I say deterministic, what I mean is when you put, the first, when you put in data into the front of your black box and you churn it through and you get data at the back, you're going to get a different answer each time. It is stochastic, and you have to believe that. You have to expect that. The trends should all be there, but the exact numbers are going to be very different. And if it's always identical, then you should say, hey, what's up with the random number generator here? Something's screwed. <laughs> it's not guaranteed. You have no guarantees, right? If I'm making personalized recommendations for somebody who's in Saskatchewan, and they're in Saskatchewan, and there's one venue in Saskatchewan, I know this, that we serve. There are others, but I mean, I care about the one. And, you know, we're not necessarily going to have inventory that that person wants to see. And so then that person may get very annoyed at us and be like, why don't you have personalized recommendations for me? We're like, we're pretty sure you don't want to go see Hamlet in the park. We're pretty sure you want to go see Lincoln Park. It does have park <coughs> in it, but it's not the same thing, right? So we should not expect that it's going to be guaranteed for all people. And the final thing is it's not cheap, right? Like, a lot of people think that they're just going to throw some stuff up and it's just going to work and you can get an out-of-the-box thing and you're going to get something and it's going to be like, oh, I can use an open source package and the open source package is going to solve this for me. And open source is free, right? Like, I just go to GitHub and I download some stuff and I do some things and it's going to work, right? Well, your time isn't free. Your, the, the, the data processing isn't free. A lot of the stuff that you're going to need to do to make this stuff work isn't free. And you need to factor that stuff in. So, why do we care? Right? Apart from the fact that everybody's telling us that if we don't care, our companies are going to go under, we're all going to live in huts, and everything's going to be terrible, and we're all going to die, and yeah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, 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 I may not be as, as fatalistic about the future. First of all, we need to be able to scale well-defined tasks. Right? We need to be able to say, like, this is a, this is a well-defined task. But that doesn't mean that it's something that can be accomplished with a rules engine. It's just something that needs to be doable for a lot of people. Personalization is a well-defined task, right? I can know that I've done a good thing because you clicked on it. You interacted with that system. You did something with that system. And it was personalized to you. And I know this because you, you did something with it and you bought a ticket or whatever, right? But that doesn't mean that it can't be scalable. I don't need to have a personal concierge solving that problem for you. Rules-based systems. Who here works with rules-based systems? They suck. And you know this. And the reason they suck is because we live in an adversarial world. And our adversaries are constantly trying to manipulate our systems to come at us from different ways. We have drift in our systems. We have BTS showing up. And that's not even adversarial. It's just drift has shown up. right? But then there's also people who are trying to game the system. And when you have a rules-based system, what's going to happen is that somebody's going to figure out some way to screw around your personalization engine so that nobody knows that Tenacious D is going on sale on Friday, and then they're going to get all the tickets and put them on the secondary market, and it's going to be marked up, and nobody's going to get to be able to see the D for $55. You're going to have to pay $200, and nobody likes that, right? So nobody Tenacious D fans in here. That's cool. It's just me. <coughs> but still, it's a problem. So this leads us to having better customer service outcomes, right? Because what's happening is that we're able to scale these systems up, and as a result, these systems now do what the customer wants them to do in a fuzzy way, right? To the point where the customer says, hey, man, you only got two out of three recommendations right for me. And it's like, dude, we got two out of three recommendations right for you. Like, like six weeks ago, you had nothing, so what do you want from my life, right? <laughs> it's still a better customer experience than somebody complaining about like, it's better, but it's not platinum. It's like, well, then we can work on what it means to be platinum, but we still got some stuff up. Finally, your data is your business, right? This is a, this is a sort of fundamental paradigm shift that a lot of people really haven't seemed to grasp yet. And I think it's very important to, to, to bring up is that, you know, who your customers are, who the relationships are that you and your business have maintained, that you've grown, you know, you spent potentially decades, potentially centuries, make, building and maintaining relationships with other entities. And to just give the details of that out to a third party, that's a lot of trust that you have to have. And so building this stuff in-house actually makes a lot of sense if what you're doing is core to your business. But at the same time, if you don't have the capabilities of building this stuff out in-house, having yet another trusted third party work with you may also make sense. And that's a business decision that you have to weigh. And you should also ask questions like, how penetrable is their network? Because now they have all the details about your business and all the people that you've worked with. And so now if they have all of your client lists 
And they have all of your customer lists. And they have all the ticket prices going back to 1976. <laughs> that's, that's a problem, right? If they're not protecting their systems. So you need to think about what is fundamental to how your business works and how you're going to let this happen. I probably need to go a little faster. So here's, some, here's a seven point checklist for how you should start thinking about doing data science in your business. First of all, make sure you really, 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 really want to do this, right? You need to have a monetary goal in mind that you are going to optimize against, right? A specific problem. You're not doing artificial intelligence because you have to do artificial intelligence. You're not doing machine learning because you have to do machine learning because it's a buzzword. I said deep learning. I said, you know, blah, blah, blah. You have to say, this is a problem a business needs to solve and this is the money associated with solving it. Either because I think there's an opportunity in the market that nobody's capturing right now, that's how you get disruption, or this is a piece of the market that we have to protect, right? If you're not asking that type of question, then you're gonna have a hard time and you're gonna end up spending a lot of money chasing a goal that may not ever manifest because you don't have a clear goal in mind. Second, uh, this is an important one. Is, do other people use data science to solve the problem? Now, there's two sides of answering this. If the answer is no, it may be that you're trying to, you know, <laughs> trying to kill a cockroach with a jackhammer or a nuclear bomb, and you know, you may be using a, a little bit too much weaponized infrastructure to solve a problem, or it may be that you've got something very disruptive on your hands, like you've got a very interesting problem that you need to solve it with. So, but it's a, it's a, you know, doing your due diligence to look around and see what the rest of the market has is, is a very important thing to do because if somebody's already done research in this area and they've already used machine learning, then maybe you can just build on their coattails. Figure out how to work around the patents, so on and so forth, right? But you still have to do something to make sure that, like, maybe it's not even feasible. You don't know. Third, you should run some preliminary offline work. So preliminary offline work is you're going to put, I don't know, 10 million transactions in a notebook and you're going to see what's going on. And if you know what a notebook is, a Python notebook, something like that, some sort of quick exploratory technique. Where if you don't know what that is, then we're going to talk about how you can get to some quick exploratory techniques. But you know, some sort of quick, something that you can spend like a, you can you or somebody you've hired can spend a week or a month or something just exploring the data, churning through and seeing like I think that there's some patterns here we could take advantage of before you throw the whole full nut at it. Before you try to figure everything out, right? You need to do that exploration. Then you need to determine the cost of implementing your best case scenario. Double it, because you're, you're just too optimistic. I promise you you're optimistic. And then don't forget maintaining it once it's up. And now you have to ask, your, have to ask yourself is when you look at those numbers of your monetary goal up top and your data science spend at the bottom, is it worth it? Chances are good, the answer is no. Oh shit, you're just hockey sticked. Maybe now it's worth it. Maybe now you gotta get ahead of it. Maybe you don't wanna be this conservative and wait until it hockey sticks. Maybe you have a crystal ball and have decided that this is gonna be a serious problem. Well. Go for it. That's up to you, right? That's part of the decision of running a business is how to make these decisions in the first place. And then finally, a really important thing that you really have to look at is regulations, right? So fraud has a lot of regulations. GDPR, CCPA, KYC. If you don't know what those, thing, what those initials are, those TLAs are, QLAs are, and you're trying to work in fraud, you've got some problems because those, those things are going to come, come to bite you. Who knows what GDPR is? Yeah, exactly. Right? So if you have customer data flying through the fraud systems and it's not somehow sequestered from your regular systems, you're going to have a fun time when audits come around. So, money. Money is the, ultimately why we're here. Let's be honest. Let's not pretend otherwise. Like, we do have some philosophical goals. We don't want to make money at the expense of our morals. But we are here to make money. And so the idea is, how much money do you want your system to make? Right? Can you measure your brand impact in money? Right? Can you measure sort of the, uh, you know, what is the lifetime value of a customer? That's a very important marketing question. And it's really a question of just money, but in terms of brand impact, right? How can you measure that? That's a very, very, very hard question to answer. And are you just tying that to your current fiscal year? Are you tying it to lifetime value or tying it to five year plans? How does that matter for your other cost projections? These are all things that you have to, these are all things you have to take into account. So fraud that hit the bottom line, right? Money that hit the bottom line, very straightforward, no. Because fraud has a, you have up to a year for a chargeback, right? So when you're trying to put together your balance sheet for the year and a chargeback comes in on day 364 for $10,000, which then triggers a KYC, which then triggers a whole bunch of other nonsense, and it's at the last second just squeaked under the wire, 
That will screw up your balance sheet, right? So you have to be very careful about that. Recommendations. You can do a click-through rate by marketing channel to find your final conversion, but then how do you do the attribution? Does it go to recommendations? Does it go to the television commercial that they saw? Who gets the credit? Does it get to your, your data science, or does it go to the guys who are writing the television commercial? And I guarantee you that is a fun meeting to be in. <laughs> so I talked about the problem of, of, of being novel, and in these two spaces, the problem is not novel. Uh, it's, it's very straightforward. So in that way, I'm very lucky. Right? Like, I'm not trying to solve a self-driving car because self-driving cars, as you know, we've, we've talked about it a lot, and everybody thinks that that's where the next big thing is, and they're probably right, and I, my ability to read the future in these things is terrible, otherwise, otherwise I'd buy stock. But with these things, like, there's been a lot of people who spend a lot of time working in these problems. So for fraud, there is a lot of snake oil right now. The Gar most re recent Gartner group said there's like 200 companies in the fraud space right now who are willing to sell you a fraud solution today and if any of them, we're going to talk about metrics in a second, if any of them say, well, our system is 99% accurate, just say, thank you, I'm done. This is, we're done with this meeting. I'm walking out the door. The reason why? Because if you have more than 1% of your transactions are fraudulent, you're probably hosed, right? Because of the way that that fraud will hit your bottom line. So 99% accuracy means that you can just say, it's all good. And then the 1% that you screw up is fraud. And you're 99% accurate. And you're going to go to your CTO and, or your, your CFO and say, I was 99% accurate at stopping fraud. Yeah, but that 1% came back as chargebacks, screwed up our ability to do, you know, you know to, uh, to process credit cards. And each one of those came directly out of the bottom line. Each one of those is a direct hit against all of our AOI. <laughs> yeah, nobody's going to like that message. Recommendations. So there's plenty of solutions in recommendations. So how do you find out what you want to do? There's, there's public data here, European credit card transactions. I was just pointed out. Um, that's public data, so if you use it to build your system on, you're, you're going to have a hard time because uh, it's protected, for one thing, and for another thing, it's from 2012, 2013, so, eh. and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not going to be what you want it to be, so maybe Kaggle competitions are a place to look. We're going to talk about Kaggle in a second. And finally, recommendations, same thing. Netflix did a whole competition about how to do recommendations. There's a lot of papers out there. Read them. They're cool. Some of them. Preliminary work. So. Here's the question. All right, if you could solve this with off-the-shelf solutions, that means you don't have to hire a bunch of PhDs to go through and figure out something novel. Yay, PhDs are expensive. <laughs> so then the question is, can you get a data scientist to create a model? Can you just spend $25,000 and go to Kaggle.com? Who here knows Kaggle? Three people, five people. Kaggle is where you should go to say, hey, I'm going to spend $25,000 and give you an anonymized data set. Tell me what you can do with it. And then you have a holdout set where you don't give it to them, and then you see what they do in the holdout set. And oh shit, you could get some really good solutions, and you could say, like, that dude, I'm hiring that dude. Because he just came up with a solution that I didn't see coming that got 96% accuracy on my holdout set, right? The data I didn't give to them, right? And so all of a sudden, you've, got, you've done your preliminary work very quickly. Right? And because people are willing to do that for money. You could also do it for kudos if you want, but then you might not get the hire, you know, the good competitors there. So how do you hire this first person who's going to help you, right? Maybe you've gone to Kaggle and it's, instead of doing 25, you did 25 plus employment, right? Like a lot of people do hiring off of Kaggle where they say, like, I'll do 25 plus employment, but 25 is basically my starting bonus because I've done the preliminary work for you and now you hire me straight up. A data scientist who's going to be looking like here is going to be somebody who can talk about software engineering that isn't necessarily the best engineer that you've ever seen, right? They're not going to be somebody who's going to stay up late at night coming up with architecture diagrams. Well, they might do that, but they're going to be like, oh my god, okay, we're going to do AWS Lambda to API. We're going to have Gateway to Lambda that's then going to hit a, you know, an RDS instance that's then going to be talking to our and you're going to hear all sorts of words and you're going to be like, oh, okay, great. Like, I don't know what those words mean. Um, good for you. Like, they're not going to necessarily be at that level of software engineer. But they're going to all be able to clearly and explain, they're going to need to be able to clearly explain what their process is and how they got there, right? And how you can replicate it. If they can't talk to you in plain English, they don't have that EQ, you probably should move on for the first data scientist. Because that first data scientist is going to be the person who interacts with everybody else in the company who's going to be the feeling that the company has for what data science really is. And if that person can't talk, mumbles into themselves, you know, is unable to, unable to express themselves, yeah, you should walk, 
right? Because you're not gonna have, you're not gonna look good when you try to sell this person to the rest of the company. And you need to have that POC. And you need to have a list of things wrong with your data. Wait, what's wrong with my data? <laughs> Who here knows what's wrong with their data? Everything is wrong with your data. I promise you, everything is wrong. I only have five minutes left, so I'm gonna go very quickly. You need to have separate systems with separate schemas, right? You probably have this, like 10 databases spread out all over the place, right? You probably have original maintainers who quit in the 70s. You have no clear data dictionary. You probably have different sources of data that have contradictions in them. How much did they spend in that transaction? $12 or 14 I don't know. You have compromises that may, somebody made. Maybe they made it six months ago and compromised. Well, this field doesn't really need to be a four byte integer. It can be a two byte, that's fine. Nobody's ever gonna need 640K. We can do that, right? They made a compromise and now it's hosing you today and you didn't even know it. Your data is not even available in real time. What's real time? Is real time pacemaker? Right? If it screws up, your pacemaker stops working. That's a pretty important definition of real time. Is it real time stock market real time? That's the old nanosecond. Is it real time? Eh, where's real time? You need to know what that means. Not available at scale. What is scale? For us, the logs that we run out of our systems during an on sale will handle 10,000 requests per second per partition. Each partition, there are 40 partitions. Right? So 400,000 requests per second during an on sale, off traffic, 100 requests per second. So that's very bursty. What is, so what does your data look like? How does it come in at you? So you need to talk about POC. This is, this is really, I really wanted to make sure that I talked about this, so I'm glad I have enough, enough time. I have a lot of other slides here, so but we'll, 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 we'll shine on that. Um, very important is, so for fraud, you need to figure out, fraud, like we've been talking a lot about how we're getting rid of people, in the fraud case, because it is very adversarial, I would recommend you don't get rid of people. I'd recommend you hire more, frankly. Because what's happening is that it is an adversarial relationship that you have with your customer, right? And those customers are trying to steal from you. And they are creative, and they are nasty, and they hate you. Well, they hate us. A lot of people don't like to come after I don't know if you knew that. So they are willing to come after you, and they think that they're taking the moral high ground, right? So what your, your goal here is not to automatically stop the fraud, right? That'd be nice, but it's not your goal. Your goal is to put it in front of a person and say, we think something's screwy with this transaction. Can you handle it? Can you look at this transaction and say, no, 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 we're, we're blocking this, right? We looked at that person's social media account. We looked at their Instagram account. We saw that they did go to the show. They said they did, didn't, right? We saw that they did get to meet with Snoop Dogg and smoke a blunt with them, and then they complained <laughs> and said that they never even got to go to the show and somebody stole their ticket. We, we see that. We have people who complain and they say, no, the show was too loud. I didn't, you know, it's like, dude, it's a death metal concert. What are you talking about? <laughs> so you have these adversarial relationships with your customer and you need to surface that in front of people so people can do the analysis to take advantage of the drift that will happen very quickly in your system, right? So then you need to surface some data. Let's say we have a month's worth of fraud data that you have to examine 45 days after the fact because of that 365 day lag time, but most of it happens up front. You should figure out how quickly your fraud transactions come in. That's, a good, that's important to know how far in the back you're looking. Take another set of end months, and then you ask yourself, if the analysts were given these cases, and you had this score, you sorted by the score the system gave you, how many cases would an analyst see, and would they see fraud? To do that, you've got to know what is your capacity of your fraud team. Does anybody know the capacity of the fraud team? Probably not. Is it 50,000 cases per month, 100,000 cases per month? How many transactions do you have? If you have millions of transactions and you have only 100,000 people who can, you know, 100,000 cases that can be worked per month, then you have to figure out a very good sorting function to make sure that you're bubbling up the most important stuff. That is precision. It's critical because you are dealing with humans. So if, you have, if a human has to wade through 20 cases to get to a fraud case, they might just skip that 20th case because, wow, well, not fraud, not fraud, not fraud, not fraud, not fraud. So you need to make it precise. Precision is the ability to surface good stuff. Recall is how much of your fraud would you catch if you did this sorting? Right? Are you catching 80%? Are you catching 20%? If you're catching 20%, they're probably going to tell you to you know, go twist. They've got you know, a certified rules to deal with that. How much money would you save, and how does the model deal with drift? Right? You need to be able to know what you're currently doing 
and be able to say, if I implement this system, I am going to get this much better, right? So I have less than two minutes left, so I have more to talk about. Does anybody have any questions before, at this point? Yes, sir. So Matt, I remember when I was speaking to you, you mentioned you've used AI as part of the data and you know, how you got data science and AI together. Yes. Can we just talk a minute on that? Absolutely. So this, so, okay. I know we've, we've heard a lot of a, a lot of sort of hyperbole today, and I want to make sure that I bring it down to, to brass tacks. When you're looking at something like this, precision and recall, like these are data science terms for how well your artificial intelligence is solving the problem, right? And you need to be able to say, okay, I've hired somebody, they're creating a model, right? They're using statistics to pull information, to pull meaning out of a large amount of information that I have on it. And I want to take actions based on that meaning. In this case, what I'm doing is I've got millions of transactions, and I'm pulling a score out of that. How good does that score, how well does that score represent the problem? Like if, if somebody who's is one, like if you have 99% recall and 99% precision on your fraud problem, that means you solve fraud. That means you found every adversary who's going against you, and you should be very nervous about that answer because that means you have data bleed. That somehow you put like the label of whether or not it was fraud in, the, in your test. So what you do is you say, I've got a whole bunch of data columns. 500 columns, 1,000 columns, 12 million columns, whatever. A whole bunch of columns that are all features about your data. And alongside of each one of them, I have a label from each one of these graders. This is called supervised learning, because I have a supervisor who said one or zero, fraud or not fraud. And then I just go through and I find what's the answer. Like, can I come up with a technique that accurately predicts that zero or one, right? And if I can do that, then I can use this system automatically to provide the scoring to surface in front of people. Now, I have also slides about how to do this for recommendation, which is a lot of matrix math, so, which I think is very fun. But it's probably a little dense. So anyway, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think we just got time for one more. Could you share and then? Oh, OK. OK, I've got So I was wondering, how did you just to justify the cost of running analysis to fit a bus? For example, you can have a bunch of a high-end NVIDIA GPU on cloud versus you have just a very limited CPU on a single machine, but the former probably take one minute to run through one terabyte data, the other probably take a month. So how do you justify your you know, the strategy to hire those you know, resources? I, I, don't, I don't know how much you pay your data scientists, but at the rate data scientists go to these days, a GPU instance is way cheaper. Just way cheaper. And so I can spend even $50 an hour throwing P3, you know, 16x larges at a data scientist, and they're gonna get me answers at the rate of one every 20 minutes. I will do that, right? If on the other hand, they haven't demonstrated, but they need to do that POC first to demonstrate that there is some there there, right? Because what happens is that you get somebody who is tired, you know, they're, they're machines for turning coffee into data science models. And if they run out of coffee and they forget to turn off their $50 an hour instance, then all of a sudden, like, your instance costs as much as your data scientist, and that's a problem, right? So you need to be able to have somebody justify what's going on there, and you need operation back support to block them when they try to go for more than 10 hours or something like that. Other thoughts? Oh, yeah. We are out of time. Thank you. We're going to move on to the last session of the day, and I'm going to bring the, lead, the moderator. We have Diego, who's a leader at Slalom Consulting, and he's going to moderate the panel with the leaders in uh, fine, uh, insurance, farm insurance, and Activision. So with that, Diego, I'm going to hand it over to you and start the session. Excellent. Thank you. <coughs> Such a diverse of speakers. Um, I think Walter was the craziest, smartest, most uplifting speaker I've heard in a while. Um, and what I'm going to do last to finish such a great event is really go to real world scenarios. Um, talk to our lovely panelists, Amanda and Stephanie, which I'll introduce in a second. 
to understand where they are in their AI journey. Um, you know, look at concrete use cases, um, understand some challenges, and really just learn and share with you um, how they, they dealt with this along the way. So after putting the mics on, um, let me just introduce Amanda Bailey, Mark Division. I'm going to read this to make him justice. Uh, Activision Publishing has been working in database analytics and decision sciences for more than 14 years, leading teams to optimize marketing efforts, <coughs> in-game engagement and experiences, and player life and value. And my other, my, I mean, my other panelist, Stephanie Lloyd, has more than 12 years of product, pricing strategy, distribution, and consulting experience at Farms Insurance. She's currently at the head of new ventures at Farmers and President of Toggle, an innovative insurance brand in today's consumer launch last year. Well, well, thank you for attending and for welcome both. And I know I just introduced you, uh, but I want to learn a bit more about what you do today, your current project, your objectives. So, yep. you start? I'll start. A more. So, Stephanie Lloyd, have been with Farmers for 12 years, as Diego said. Uh, last year, actually literally a year ago, uh, I was sitting in the chief underwriting seat. So I was responsible for the profitability and underwriting strategies for the personal lines unit at Farmers Insurance. And I got called into the CEO's office and overnight, I affectionately say, I went from the office of no to the office of yes. <laughs> so I was offered a position to run a new division at Farmers called New Ventures. That is, uh, the sole mission was to build products and services for millennials or the next generation consumer. And it was, here's a budget. You're essentially running a startup within farmers and you can figure out how you want to step. The option is uh, you know, models and agents uh, providing insights and value. Tell us more about where you are. I must go with men. All right, yeah, I'll start. Um, so we are pretty far along in several areas where we have productionalized uh, several deep learning or, um, or machine learning efforts. Um, a couple of examples, uh, like on the marketing side, come from um, the need to uh, increase the engagement within the game. And I don't know how many of you have ever played a game where you die a lot and really quickly when you're not very competitive. It really decreases your. Um, it really decreases like how how much time you'll spend in the game. Um, and often you don't know how to play. You don't know why somebody can run around and hit you with a bag of coins and knock you out while you were shooting at them. Um, so there is a huge opportunity to figure out how to, um, how to have competitions that have happened every year for several years, but you know, kind of iterating on that to be able to understand, okay, people are creating obscene words and texts and images and swastikas and just stuff because when people are exposed to really obscene materials, we know that 20% of them um, immediately fall off of whatever platform they're on. Um, they've become, uh, they're no longer fans or no longer, no longer have accounts, um, online accounts with those companies. So that's a big problem. We do, we do have some social scientists. We have, um, we have a really big team of, of consumer insights that does a lot of qualitative work on um, just player health, community health, community involvement, um, and, and we're really we're really involved with that. The bio games not too far from here. They employed psychiatrists with PhDs from UCLA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to try to all of the questions from the very end. <laughs> Otherwise, we're not too many moderators. <laughs> but thanks for the question. Um, let me ask you, I wanted to, to go back to some of the use cases and try to elaborate more on one or two of them. So for the marketing, let's say, um, what was that process like? Uh, you know, when we saw what those speakers talk about what it takes to understand what that use case could be, the need to run a POC, if you find a POC, understanding the feasibility of the use case, et cetera. Can you talk more about that process, how long it took, and you know, share you know, the experience with the other audience? Yeah, we had um, we had somebody that works on a lot of our in-game messaging applications. Um, that also is a data scientist and kind of kicked off um, the POC for this as a as a much deeper learning process. And what they did, they took um, 
uh, a pretty good sample size of data and looked at for people that have really high scores per minute. So they're incredibly competitive in the game. Um, but what that also meant was if you play the game, you know that there's all different types of play styles. There are people that are big runner gunners. There are people that are campers and they'll hide behind stuff and just jump out and get one kill and then they'll die. There are people that sit way up in, um, in, in a sniping area and then they'll snipe. You don't want to, like, you, those guys are not all the same. All those players are not the same. So what you wanted to do was figure out what all that play style looked like um, and then what features contributed to that um, to say, okay, if, if Amanda plays, um, how does she get better and closer to that higher score per minute when her play style is, you know, like the campers? Um, and so you start to iterate what, the, what, those, what those features are, whether it's kills or deaths or, um, or grenade launches. Um, the, the loadout that you choose for your character and your um, um, and your and your and your weapons, and and you start to see what the variance is for those folks and how they play, and say, okay, Amanda, you're really bad at, at grenade launches, so you need to get get a lot better at that, and that's actually going to increase your score per minute for your play style. Um, and so we just started kind of looking at all of those things um, and then figuring out what that meant trying to get into a, a productionalized state. And, um, I can keep going, but what we ended up doing was um, using a, a k-nearest means model um, and a, a psychic learn library uh, because it's really good with unsupervised learning. Um, and, then, and then iterating on that and, and measuring what, um, if somebody took the recommendations we were making, uh, how, how improved their engagement was in the game. Uh, Stephanie. Just as exciting as gaming is insurance. <laughs> 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 that, that we're doing a lot of exciting things for Toggle. Is it Toggle the, the product that we launched last year? Right? It is. So, uh, we, like I said, we started in March and the, the mission was to have revenue in market by October. And if you think of a normal kind of, at least for a big large incumbent like Farmers, typical product development cycle is 18 months to 24 months if you're going fast. So to be told in, in March that you need revenue in market by October, it was kind of a whole new world. So uh, we did that. And a lot of what we're doing in this space is really trying to set ourselves up for future capabilities. So setting up that roadmap, knowing the business challenges from the existing business that we're looking to solve for, how our new technology stack and customer experience and target customers behave differently than the traditional, and how to leverage that 90 years of data and history and experience, but have the, the nimble technology stack and the nuances of our product and customer and how we kind of bridge that and use kind of the best of both worlds. So that's what we've been really heads down focused on. But the exciting thing for me coming into this, clean piece of paper, we got to build the product, the customer experience, everything from scratch versus having kind of that legacy system or you know millions of customers and thousands of agents that you would disrupt as you were building something. We actually got to do it just focused on the customer, what does the customer want, and let that dictate everything else. And within that customer experience, have you identified AI <coughs> amount of use cases or even RPA use cases that you're planning to deliver in the future? Yeah, so the really great thing about, not that this is you know, self-promoting of the product, but for what we did is actually redesign a product to be very customizable, which is pretty different than the traditional insurance policy. And so throughout our experience, customers can toggle up and down their, their personal package selections. And so leveraging data, the recommendation engine for us is going to be really key. So right now we're gathering the learnings and making sure that we're storing the data and also getting value from the data from day one to make sure that we're recommending the right things depending on where the customer comes from or what partnership it is, crafting and curating the right customized package for them. The other thing we did is also step back and say, where did we not want to use AI? So you hear a lot about chatbots and you know using that to speed up and, and bring your costs down. For us, that is our sole interaction with the customer on a, on a product and industry that's got low engagement. And so for us, in those moments where they want to engage with us, 
we actually felt like that should be more personal and not use technology in all of those instances. That's very interesting. I, I, I feel the same way. I, I'm from, as you can tell with my accent, born and raised in Buenos Aires, lived in London, lived in the States. I got that from your accent. I hate it. I, well, I still love it. It depends how tired I am. But yeah, talking to an AI agent or NLP algorithm, uh, ML, is not the happiest moment in my life. Um, especially when they don't give you the option to then connect with uh, a human. Right? You're just repeating yourself and trying to get the right option on the menu, and that can be very frustrating. Um, the recommendation engine you mentioned, is that already in production? Is that, what kind of recommendations are you given? Yeah, so that's one where we're in the, essentially we've done the design work. So we knew, we started from the end, we knew the business challenge we were looking to solve for. Right. And then we said, what data did we need to collect to be able to do that? What's the architecture, the infrastructure? What are the, um, we're really big on finding the right build or buy moments especially as a kind of startup trying to do things quickly. What are the things we needed to do ourselves and what things did we partner on? So we're in that phase where right now we're just now collecting all the data. We only had two states live between October and March and we sold 800 policies, right? So baby steps, learning to two small states. And in March we launched in nine additional states and sold 2,000 policies. And so the volume of data that we're now getting and learning is, is really picked up, and that's the most exciting part, is you'll actually get to see that come to market pretty quickly. I see. Well, it's great that we have you know, two different stages within the AI journey, completely different industries, completely different use cases, but tell us about challenges. What was the biggest challenge, say, back to the use case of brand marketing that you faced, and how did you overcome it? Um, I think probably the, the biggest challenges are how do we get started? How do we get started with POC? We, we know the problem, um, but how do, what, data, what data do we use? How are we going to implement this? Um, what, um, are we going to get buy-in from the, from the business? Um, how, do we, how do we sell it so that we can actually scale it and productionalize it? Um, I think those were probably the biggest hurdles that we you know, slowly overcome by um, by getting the POC out there, by showing what it could be with the connections that we would have for making the recommendations. So connecting it to Alexa skill and to the companion app in mobile, um, into the in-game messages that we push through first party with like Sony and Xbox. And how long was that process just to? It, from end to end, it was 10 months. months. Yeah. Stephanie, challenges within the early stages of your AI journey? Well, I'm not going to answer that exact question. I think one of the biggest things, having been in the underwriting position as an incumbent that I observed was, we're a 90-year company with massive amounts of data. Right. So data could be arguably our biggest strength, but if you don't operationalize it, if it's not clean, it's your biggest weakness. And as we were thinking about insurtechs, disruptors in our space that had the nimble technology stacks, they didn't have our data, they didn't have our experience, they didn't have our brand, but they were fast and they had kind of modern technology. And so for us, going into it, we knew we had to make sure that we were leveraging our strength. Wow. So the data, the brand, and then marrying it with the strengths of the insure techs. And so one of the biggest um, just hurdles that I had in my old role was deployment. So you can have all that data, you can get all those insights, but if you aren't actually able to deploy the models into production where you're actually acting on the learning and getting true business value, and if it takes you, I had a model that I desperately needed that took 18 months to get into production. And by the time you actually got it into production, the strength of the model was no longer what it was when you first built it. And so for us, solving for that from day one was, was like mission critical. Can I ask which platform you use to do the deployment? So we're in proof of concept testing several, yeah. but the one we like right now is uh, Algorithmia. Okay. It allows uh, my modelers to do the modeling and essentially push it into production, and it just generates calls back to you. So we can externalize pieces of our policy processing, underwriting, and uh, fraud outside of certain systems and kind of decouple it, so that really helps with speed and, and just agility as you move. Uh, to different players. Well, thanks for that. Um, 
Let's shift gears and, and talk about maybe trends within your industries. What do you see like other trends? Um, how are you going to differentiate yourselves from others? Uh, and how much of AI, ML, etc., you're using to, to do that? For us, um, um, the big shift, and I'm sure a lot of parents in here um, hear about Fortnite a lot. So um, the big shift in our industry is the free-to-play game, um, and so we're coming from. Uh, you know, a, a long history of, of selling discs and now um, downloadable cult codes, um, but trying to figure out how and for what player cohorts we start to think through um, a free-to-play model, um, and then beyond that, not being the people chasing Fortnite or chasing Apex Legends, but um, what do we what do we do next? What's the what's the next in kind of game simulation. So we have a lot of people working on um, on that and what that means to the player and also what does that mean for cannibalization uh, across the rest of our titles and, and, and the way that we have modeled our, our games so far. Yeah, so there's a couple things and it really gets to the consumer trend of just instant gratification and only paying for what I need. And so in the insurance space, what, what you're seeing is players coming in with on-demand insurance, and I think it was, uh, our, our partner from EY mentioned it earlier, but right, insurance is a game of large numbers, and now it's becoming a very individualized thing, and folks want, I only want it for this moment in time type of coverage scenario, and they also want instantaneous claims payout. And so it's this notion of like, make it really convenient, streamlined, quick, and you know, one of the things we've observed in that is it's easy to do you know, streamline straight through claims processing is just an example. But as Mark mentioned, there's a lot of fraud out there. And so if you tell me that your fur jacket was $800, I can pay you $800 instantly. That's not the problem. But knowing that it really wasn't your fur coat or wasn't really valued at $800 or, or whatever that <coughs> looks like is the tricky part. And so for us, we've seen a lot of people get the marketing and the press over some of these straight through processing. and, and that's easy enough to do when you're not in the game of trying to also make money and, and keep your prices as competitive as possible. So we're trying to do that intelligently and, and ease our way into it. Thank you. Um, I think we uh, we a bit um, cut short of time, I, but I had a. I'm gonna no no. Before we do, I'm gonna ask one more question because <laughs> I want to ask this one, uh, and then we'll open the floor. Um, I'll ask two different questions. Uh, Amanda, <laughs> what common misconceptions you dealt with in the workplace outside of it related to the space? And, and, and um, they're exactly what Mark hit on earlier, um, that, that data science is deterministic, um, that, it, that it's really easy, and, and like what they're looking for is guaranteed. Um, it, I mean, those are those are really those are really some of the biggest hurdles, and um, and really comes down to uh, educating the business, continuing to to talk about the same message so that it finally resonates. Because um, they'll parts of the business unit will hear buzzwords, um, and they'll they'll read something just enough to be dangerous, and they'll like. Um, oh, hey, for Q2, let's put attribution on the roadmap, and and then and then we'll have tons more ROI for all our channels. No, <laughs> I like the way you're thinking, but l let's start somewhere with a POC, and and I think those are really some of the biggest challenges in this space. And, and Steph, um, if you could just uh, say, well, I'm trying to think of. of, of Finish with a little cheeky question, but um, you know, what question are you most tired of hearing within your space? I think you get in this early stage and you know give you a chance to answer so that no one asks you again. <laughs> That's it. So it's funny when when we set out, it was don't integrate anything and you're a standalone and do everything kind of skunk works mission. And now I'm constantly being asked for reporting. And you know, can you just feed this other beast of a machine? And it's like, well, everything that it, we needed, all, all the freedom that we needed to get up and do what we did quickly is now slowly being kind of eroded by the ask of further and further integration before we're anything. 
you know, so, I, you know, I've got claims people that want co full-blown compliance reviews, and I'm like, there's four claims. Like, could we, <laughs> could we wait for a critical mass before we do the cavity search? And so, you know, it, I just have to constantly remind people of all the, the freedoms we needed to get up and running. We're not at that critical mass yet. Like, let us learn and grow, and we're not optimized yet. I get asked to optimize and it's like we're in the test and learn phase. It's not time for optimization. So I am going to spend probably more for my acquisition costs now than I will six months from now. And we should know that going into it. Amazing. All right. Let's open the floor for a few more. Is this for Stephanie? Oh, it's not good. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, when you're working with such progressive technologies, um, and both of you have been established companies, I think Stephanie, you said your company's 90 years old, right? Um, how have you gone about tackling uh, the issues around the, finding the talent, people who can actually do that kind of work and you know, live up to the promises that you're making? Um, they build out a team from there. Um, for us, uh, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, everybody that's a gamer really wants to work in gaming. Um, so there's, there's a pretty good pool. Now, it's not always the best, and one of the big struggles is not very diverse. Um, I've got a team of 30, and I'm one of two women. Um, and then it's also, we, up to about four years ago, we manufactured DVDs, and we sold them to Best Buy and to GameStop. That's all we did. Now we are completely a live, I mean, we are almost completely a live services organization that has to look at its data um, in real time um, to see what's going on. So we haven't quite caught up with the need for data science and what that means and um, how, how technical that workforce is. So we're still kind of struggling um, to recognize what that means for a value perspective. Uh, a manager in data science is not the same as a manager on product, and we still kind of equate them the same. So we we have a couple of opportunities because of who we are, um, and then and then some 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 difficult areas. Yeah, I, I was in the fortunate position where other business units are actually looking for my group as a retention play for their most talented employees. A lot of times, people that are really good in this space can kind of get frustrated in a large incumbent, you know, that's slow moving. And so a lot of, I can't believe, it was one of those most amazing career opportunities where you got to pick your team and you had people pitching you their best talent. And so I was very fortunate that I got to go and kind of hand pick people for rotational <coughs> spots. So we supplemented with outside. I hired a couple of folks externally and then uh, I do rotations where they get to come in, help us learn our way of thinking, and then transplant them back in so they're guaranteed a spot back. Um, so they can bring that kind of that new way of thinking. For me, it was less of a technical uh, strain, more of a mindset. I need to find people with the right mindset to kind of live and thrive in, in our world, which is just different than what they were used to. So, Cindy, you partially answered my question, but uh, I'm interested in the kind of the business imperative behind the launch of Toggle, and you know, what uh, did, did farmers have a, a pipeline of viable products and POCs that, that they that they wanted to, to start moving forward with, or it was a tabula rasa. Yeah, so there was a couple things that were part of the imperative. One was we did a lot of segmentation work at our existing uh, customer base and. and uh, audiences we were attracting and realized that we were skewing much older and as we thought about that kind of just that next generation we needed to start infusing younger and younger consumers into the flow and so it was how do you do that in a cost-effective way where you can test and learn and find the, the things that work what's attracting um, we're also going through a significant policy system and claim system transformation that's taken a number of years and so a lot of things couldn't be touched because of that, right? We're going from one system to another system. And so it was, how do we innovate? How do we attract a younger generation consumer, but do so during these huge policy processing transformation of, of systems 
And so that was kind of, we've never done anything quickly. Our industry is being disrupted. Let's just see what we can do. Did you have products in the works? No. You, no. I mean, we have, in the core, we have traditional products, but that was targeting a different customer. And so for this specific customer, we didn't have anything in the works. We got to kind of start from scratch and just see what happened. Hi, my name's Erica Nolting Young. I'm with Long Consulting. Thanks, Diego, for running the panel today. Um, I was having a really interesting conversation with a young woman in my business the other day who does a uh, women in big data group here in LA, and she said uh, they've been having conversations about how bias is inherent in the questions that we ask of data and what we get out of the data. And both of your businesses have skewed very male. And there's this huge opportunity to tap into many new segments of the marketplace. So how are you overcoming that challenge today? So I don't know if it's because my, my team is actually 60% women, 40% male. And I don't know if it's because uh, my it's small team, myself and my co-pilot, Michelle, uh, were the ones that did most of the copy and did most of the design work with an outside firm. So we actually skew significantly more female. So I, I don't know if that's because of kind of the bias, a different bias that was entered into it. Uh, but what we do <clears throat> is from every single design, from the product to the website to you know, call to actions to the placement of the logo and the size, every single decision we do for the product, we actually run through, uh, we have a partner named Alpha, if anyone's used Alpha, and we run through it <coughs> within three days, get answers to questions that we have and can make decisions based on direct consumer feedback? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> so our player base is really heavily skewed male. Um, and then just even the applicants within our company is heavily skewed male. So it's, it's, it has a lot of bias. Now the impact of which um, we've really started having a, a lot bigger focus on diversity. Um, in fact, the, uh, a woman leads the entire emerging franchises division. Um, and, and that's incorporating a lot more focus on um, what the next generation gamer looks like. And next generation gamer isn't the, my classic commando Call of Duty player. Um, it's, um, it's the people that like to watch other people play games on Twitch. Um, it's, it's people that download, you know, obviously King is a sister company, so um, there's a lot more free to play female audience than for my Call of Duty audience. So starting to look at that, we've created um, uh, an unsupervised learning uh, behavioral segmentation model, which actually Slalom was um, involved uh, on consulting for us. Um, that really starts to classify um, what the female audience is is interested in playing, um, the way they play, um, what they, what's important for them within the game, and what is available in the stores in the game. So we're getting there. No. Last, uh, last. Very short. Last, last question. Your background. Political science, first degree, art, the first degree, then science, and then, oh, I'm sorry, your background, yeah. it was not really related directly to your work. <coughs> Political science, art, was it helpful? Um, so I did a lot of things in undergrad. I thought I was going to be a doctor, and it was almost there until somebody said, oh, Go be an EMT, and and when it, it'll be a shoo in for when you go for your med school interview. I became an EMT, and I was like, no. <laughs> I thank God they exist, but that is not for me. So I, I did a lot of computer science and math, but I focused on art because it's also very creative and right brain. So it kind of just all played into to diving into marketing and 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 then wanting to get into database marketing, and then that carried me into my, my master's in science. Yeah, I mean, it didn't help me at all, my undergrad. Um, <laughs> that's the short answer. But uh, I actually wanted to be a lawyer. 
uh, for the longest time, and I went for my master's to a program that was uh, intended to help me get into a better law school. That was my grand scheme. Uh, and that's where I got my master's, and it's public opinion and polling, but I shorten it to statistics because it was essentially a using data science to solve more kind of social type issues. And I came to farmers thinking I would sit in front of a computer running regression models and, and doing data modeling, and they said I liked to make too many decisions, and I would never be comfortable making recommendations to somebody else, so I should just sit as more of the translator that heard it and helped to enact it. And that's where I sit. All right. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you, and a great set of diverse leaders. Um, and we are the close of the session, so we have a few things um, before we wrap this up. Uh, before I forget, outside there's lunch, so we're going to feed you more if you haven't eaten enough since morning. <laughs> so that's lunch outside. And, what, and um, Druva, uh, one of our platform sponsors, came, came in and talked, and I know we had a substitution. But we had a video to play, so we want to play a quick video of Truba. So, um, across and, and a diversified portfolio, uh, and having grown through acquisitions, we inherited pretty much you know, anything that we can think of. So, uh, backup, archive, in general, um, you know, smart way of managing our data and its footprint was, was the key challenge. Um, having lost data um, in the recent years, uh, having too much reliance on local people, um, the traditional ways of you know, doing it in a linear fashion. Uh, those are some of the key challenges for uh, us to consider. But what we were really interested in was something that was truly born uh, in the cloud and was optimized to handle the efficiencies of a you know, cloud as an infrastructure per se, uh, and can give us you know, a, a single state of affairs to look at. So, um, it wasn't just to you know bring a uh, consistent, uh, predictable state for our current based business, uh, but also as we continue to grow and acquire, uh, how do we bring these new uh, entities on board, uh, and how smartly can we handle that? When we talk about um, you know mergers and acquisitions and how effectively we can bring those entities on board, um, you know at the core of it we are a consulting organization and the lowest common denominator of our. Revenue from backup and set, you name it. So there was no uh, single uh, secure um, uh, who, who owns what, um, how much of it. Heard of Dell? You might not have heard of Boomi. Um, our tagline is we uh, our business outcomes accelerated. So you, uh, from an integration standpoint, we have an API management suite, a MDM suite, and a, a flow application. So we like to say that. We can connect your applications, your systems, your processes, your devices, almost anything um, faster and uh, easier than anything else to achieve better accelerated business outcomes. So stop by if you'd like to hear more. Uh, we have over 8,200 customers. We're adding six customers a day. And um, we're just giving this, uh, giving this nice little um, speaker away. And I'm just going to, you, know, you want to pick it? Sure. Reach the bottom. Must be present to win. <laughs> That's right. No. Are the roots? <laughs> yeah. All right. We've got Christine Chuve from Farmers Insurance. Congratulations, Christine, and thanks for having us. UCLA. My daughter is a uh, junior uh, here in the pre med school, so I'm happy, happy to support it. Thanks. Thank you to all the sponsors and, and the speakers the, who spend the time to come out here. I think it was very, very educational for me. Z scaler. Z scaler. Z scaler. All right. What is Z scaler? Come on up. Just at the right time. Thank you.
Yeah. yeah, so it was very, uh, going back to um, the, the speakers, the, it was very educational for me. We got, we got a celebrity audience, uh, or a producer. I, mean, I, I thought it was fascinating what Walter is doing um, in the space. Mark, kind of from the data science and AI coming together. Stephanie and Amanda, great career path. <laughs> and, and the work you're doing with AI and data. And uh, also um, our first speaker, uh, Ian Y. Chris, if he's in the room, he may have left, but uh, it's fascinating to learn what um, you know. What are the key? You know, one thing I like is you know you, you got to go. I, I think there was a statement he made. You you're too late if you're not going fast. And the speed of that of that was I think he said two years. If you it's two years if you're not doing anything in AI, you are obsolete. Um, if I remember right. So great set of speakers. Mark your calendar for July 18th, which is the next uh, event, our summer event. And we got action packed agenda coming up there as well. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure it's going to be a sold out event. Uh, I told uh, Rafi, you know, let's uh, just do it. Or somebody was telling me it was Amanda. So, it's like, this, you should do it more like the airplane analogy. Don't turn people away because they always four book you. <laughs> we don't have $100 certificate, but it's a good analogy. Because we do have chairs, uh, but we just sold out events. So thank you, everyone, for showing up and enjoy the food.